everyone. Welcome to the next lecture in our cover to cover series. The, today we'll be looking at the book of Ezra and I've titled this Three Little Birds. Yes, after the Bob Marley song. So here's the map to try to sort of situate ourselves in history. And you can see that we're getting to the end of our Old Testament timeline with regard to the Israelite people. So we're going to be down here in this time of the return and the rebuilding of the temple um, and what's called Second Temple Judaism. And we'll be looking at this period in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Here's our not quite perfect map of the or chrono chronological order of the books of the Bible. Like I said, not quite perfect, but gives you an idea. And when it comes to the historical books, definitely helpful for seeing the timeline. So we've ended Second Kings, Second Chronicles time period. There's about a 70 year period of exile. And then we've got the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, which we'll be looking at in the next few lectures. So the decree of Cyrus is what precipitates the return of this remnant of people to Jerusalem. How did this come to be? Well, if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar is the Babylonian leader who took that southern kingdom into exile. He dies in 562 BC, and his death is followed by a pretty swift decline in Babylonian power. And in its wake, Persia rises to prominence. So in 538, King Cyrus is ruling the kingdom of Persia, and he decrees that the Jewish people can be uh, allowed to return to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. Now, two things about this. We've got a shift here where we're no longer going to hear um, necessarily about the Israelites. Rather, we're going to see them referred to as the Jewish people. Sometimes they'll still be called Israel. It's interchangeable, uh, but they are no longer a nation. They don't you know, have a king ruling over them. They don't have political power. They are not prominent. So because of this, they really are more united by their religion. And so again, being called the Jewish people rather than the nation of Israel. And then the other thing is, this was prophesied by Isaiah. And we'll see that when we get to the book of Isaiah. So Cyrus in general, allowed this for all the people that Babylon, Babylon had conquered. Um, he allowed them to be returned back to their original homeland, and he allowed the people to practice their religion. So even though they're going back to their original homeland, it's still part of Cyrus's kingdom. So he could have said, yes, you can go back, but you have to worship the gods of Persia. But he didn't do that. He gave them some semblance of religious freedom. So Cyrus's decree is what begins this return. But as we will see, only a remnant go back. A lot of the people elect not to return to Jerusalem. Here's a map of Cyrus's empire, and I've circled in red kind of the key areas we'll be looking at in the next few lectures. We've got Jerusalem here. Um, here we've got the Babylonian Empire, which is where the southern kingdom was taken into exile. And then here we have Susa, and this is where the story of Esther will take place. And here is just another map, just pulling back a little bit to show you how big of an empire this actually was. And then finally, this is modern day kind of overlay and showing you what countries are in that area now. So we've got a, lar a large portion of the Middle East and even you know parts of Pakistan, most of Pakistan, a little bit of India, Afghanistan, quite a huge territory when you think about it. Here's a map of Israel's captivity. So this purple line represents kind of a review uh, when that northern kingdom called Israel was taken into captivity by Assyria. This is the region of Assyria. Um, you remember that they do not allow the Israelites ever to go back to their territory. And in fact, most of the Israelites died in captivity or become so assimilated that they just become part of the Assyrian culture. So what Assyria did do was actually take Babylonians and other peoples in this region of the ancient Near East, and they repopulated this northern part of 
what was once the kingdom of Israel. So they send um, these Gentile people to populate Samaria, and they're going to adopt a semblance of the Jewish faith, not exactly matching, but there's some aspects that kind of overlap. But we're going to see a lot of conflict between the Judeans and the Sumerians, and uh, this is going to come into play in the New Testament. And then this green line has um, that southern kingdom of Judah being taken into Babylon. And then here is a closer look at where they would have been in Babylon itself. So this region that's shaded green would have been the area of the Jewish settlements. And you can see that there is a canal, there's water going through. This was a a pretty nice region. They didn't just like throw them out in the wilderness. They gave them a good place to settle. And that's some of why people don't really want to go back. Uh, but you can see this in relationship to Susa, which is where Esther will end up. Here's the Persian Gulf down here. So originally Ezra and um, Nehemiah were one book. Uh, they were written and compiled by the chronicler. So scholars believe that the person that wrote First and Second Chronicles, which was also one book, wrote Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, many scholars, or maybe not many, but some scholars say that this was actually authored by Ezra himself. Certainly in Ezra, we have first person accounts and in Nehemiah, we have first person accounts from Nehemiah. So as with every book of the Old Testament, there's compilation going on. There's an editorial process. They're putting together sort of pieces of the puzzle, if you will. So it makes sense that Ezra certainly could have contributed a lot of material to this book. It was probably set into final written form close to the time when the events occurred, some, somewhere around 525 BC. Um, the uh, genres, we've got memoir, those first person accounts. We have documents, letters, the edict itself. We have lists, we have the inventories and uh, some census taking. So the structure of this book, it's split really into two big components. We've got construction of the temple, kind of reformation of that ruined temple and the reformation of the people, reconstructing the faith of this remnant that comes back. So the first, during the first six chapters, the leader is Zerubbabel. So there's actually three waves that come back from exile. The first wave is led by Zerubbabel. They reconstruct the temple. The second wave is led by Ezra, and he focuses on the spiritual reform of the people. The third wave is going to be led by Nehemiah, and he focuses on rebuilding the city, particularly the walls of Jerusalem. So Zerubbabel's section begins with a census, the journey itself, and then the story of rebuilding the temple from its foundations, um, putting all the pieces together to completion of the building. Um, similar pattern with the spiritual reformation of the people. So here the leader is Ezra. We see a census and a journey, and then we see um, the foundation, repentance, all the way to cleansing and the rebuilding of this community of faith. So like I said, there's three waves of return that come back from the exile. So Ezra 1 through 6 is that uh, group led by Zerubbabel. The second wave is, uh, you know, quite quite a few years later, actually, and it begins in 548 BC with Ezra. And then the third wave is with Nehemiah around 444 BC. And he is very concerned with practical governance and guidance and protection. So we'll look at that when we look at his book. During this time period, remember, Judah is only a small part of a vast Persian province. We saw that giant giant swath of land that belongs to Persia and Judas, just this tiny city in the middle of it. So they are not prominent at all. Uh, I'm sure this is part of why Cyrus was so magnanimous in the letting them go back is, you know, these people are not a threat to him. And probably it, as a good leader would understand, the kinder you are to the people, the more willing they're going to be to pledge their allegiance to you as their ultimate, you know, uh, ruler, not ruler of faith, but ruler in terms of protector and military leader. 
And here's just another map of the returns from exile, showing you the gaps kind of between the two. Esther down here somewhat. I mean, none of these dates are quite perfect, especially when it comes to, you know, the events of Esther. We're not 100% sure of that dating, but somewhere in here we think. And here are some of the prophets that we'll look at when we look at the minor prophets. And then another map, I give you lots of <laughs> visuals today of what this return looks like. So uh, there's two different routes that they take back to Jerusalem. The first route from Zerubbabel is this kind of purple line. So you can say, see, he doesn't quite take a very direct route there. And then Ezra and Nehemiah, you know, a little closer leading them back. And just again, another map of that. So the importance of this part of Israel's history uh, cannot be overemphasized. This is huge to understanding what happens when Jesus Christ comes. We're getting closer and closer. We're only about 450 years uh, away from Jesus coming, and that seems like a long time. But in the terms of human history, that's a short time. And we're going to see uh, there's a lot of ramifications for the faith of the people. So Israel's confidence had been shaken by the exile, of course. Uh, they have begun to question everything. We're going to see this repeated in the books of the prophets that look at this later time, this return from exile. But they really start to ask themselves, like, is God still our God? Are we still God's people? We broke the covenant. Is there even a covenant anymore? You know, who are we and where do we fit in this plan? And is there still a plan or has God just abandoned us? In the midst of the spiritual questions, there's also life and practical concerns. And for all intents and purposes, the Babylonian exile was not a bad one. Now, Assyria, yes, because they destroyed the northern kingdom. But for the southern kingdom, Babylon set them up in a good situation. You saw in that map, they're near water, they have good land, they're allowed to kind of plant roots and grow their families, and things are not bad there. And so most of them are like, we don't want to go back to Jerusalem. That city's in ruins, there's no temple, everything's been destroyed. It's an arduous journey to get back there through a lot of desert land. And when we get back there, what are we going back to? Nothing. So a lot of the people don't want to go back. The conditions are good. They're settled. A whole new generation has been born that doesn't even know Jerusalem. And they are still worshiping God. And they're going to now develop their faith identity outside of Jerusalem. And so most people say, no, thank you. <laughs> I choose not to go back. Um, the journey was about 900 miles, and so the best guess is that would take about four months. And like I said, once they arrived there, they had to rebuild. So it's not like they were going back to anything established. There's nothing left standing in Jerusalem. These efforts, which are led by Ezra and Nehemiah, they do give the people that return a new identity. Uh, they're going to really emphasize the temple. They're going to rebuild the temple and then emphasize it as still being the center point of their faith. Uh, they're going to want a strong religious identity to prevent being assimilated by the other nations. As we're going to see when we look at the time in between the Testaments, all sorts of different rulers are going to come into play. Uh, that territory is going to switch hands multiple times and through it all, if they're going to be remain faithful, they need to have a strong identity as God's people. So they're no longer the nation of Israel, but they're still God's people. They're going to now really be united in faith like they always should have been, and they will be now known as the Jews. But there's going to be a problem. This all sounds so good, except for they're going to go too far in the opposite direction. Oftentimes when the pendulum swings from, you know, one state of being to another, it goes too far in the other direction before it finally settles into kind of a center. And so uh, we'll see over this time period that they're going to add on to what God has handed down in terms of law. And by the time we get to, the, to Jesus, there's something like 600 
hundred laws that they're following as a people. Now, if you go back to Leviticus and Exodus and Numbers, yes, there's a lot of laws, but there's not 600 laws. So they've kind of gone opposite, gotten very legalistic, and that's going to be part of the issue that arises when Jesus shows up. So who is the Ezra? He is a descendant of Aaron. So he was a priest. He was part of the Levitical line. This makes sense as he's the one that focuses on the spiritual reformation of the people. He also operated as a scribe. These were expert interpreters of the law. And eventually the role of scribe is kind of going to displace the priesthood and they're going to take on a lot of the spiritual leadership of Israel. And he reestablishes Israel spiritually. So Zerubbabel built the temple. Ezra is going to um, instigate reform amongst the people. Themes and theology of Ezra. Well, we've got continuity with Israel's ancient past. Um, Ezra is going to link the rebuilding to a prophecy of Jeremiah. So we haven't gotten to the books of the prophets yet, but they overlay all of this history that we've just covered. So Jeremiah is actually a predecessor to Ezra. He prophesies about this rebuilding time. And so Ezra links to that to say to the people, we are still part of this ongoing plan of God's. We're not forgotten. We're not the start of a new plan. We're part of what God has been doing from the beginning. And so Ezra reviews this redemptive history. He takes us all the way back to Abraham's call, talks about Exodus, talks about the conquest of the land of Canaan. There's a lot of similarities in what's happening here. It's almost like a new Exodus, but for different reasons. Um, the people are being allowed to come back from exile. They haven't been enslaved and in Exodus they were slaves. So it's not quite the pomp and circumstance that accompanied that um, rescue from Egypt, but we do see a similar theme of going back, uh, but now it's rebuilding rather than building. Exodus was all about building this new community of faith, God's people, and Ezra and Nehemiah are going to deal with rebuilding this community into what God has intended it to be. So Ezra links this restoration to Exodus as a new Exodus. Uh, he's reminding the people of God's saving power and faithfulness of all the things God has done for the people over the years. But now they're going to understand their identity as a covenant community, which is what it always was intended to be. But they lost sight of that. Once they got a king and they had power and they were sort of the pinnacle of the ancient Near East, they lost sight of the fact that it wasn't about power and politics and women and money. It was always about their, their identity as a people of faith. And so now they're really going to focus on that because they've lost all of the other. There will be this understanding of a renewed presence of God amongst his people. So as I said, being sent into exile made them question, like, are we still God's people? Is God still with us? We're going to see some of what God has to say about that when we look at the book of the prophet of Ezekiel. He's going to have some visions that sort of explain where God is in the midst of all of this movement. But we're going to see Ezra remind the people of the importance of the temple. The temple is a a place where the people can commune with God regularly and it signals that God still desires contact with the people. God makes a way for the temple to be rebuilt. So this, again, still part of God's original plan. They are still God's people. God has not forgotten them. With this renewed emphasis on temple, there's also a renewed emphasis on the Torah or God's law. Uh, they, are, they kind of lost sight of it. We saw that in the books of the kings. And during the time of King Josiah, the book of the law had been lost. And once it was recovered, they realized, oh my goodness, we're not doing any of what we're supposed to be doing. So this time around, with this kind of rebirth of the people, they're going to focus in on understanding the law and committing to following it. And as I said, it's going to cause some trouble because they're going to add too much to it. And that's just as much of a problem as ignoring the law altogether. And we'll see the consequences of that in the New Testament period. Um, divine guidance. So the restoration that has occurred 
has resulted from God's intervention in human history. Yes, it was a human being, King Cyrus, who issued this decree, but God is certainly behind the scenes influencing and just working working out the providential happenstance things that occur. Uh, and it's been prophesied, so God knew that this was going to happen. He knew in Cyrus he would have someone he could work through. And we've seen before that God doesn't just work through his own people. God works through anybody and everybody, including Cyrus, who is not an Israelite, including at one point a donkey, as we saw in um, the story of ba Balaam and Balak. So God was behind the human kings. There is no such thing as luck or coincidence. That's called providence. God's at work. We see that God keeps his promise. The prophets have said that the exile would only last 70 years, and that is exactly how long the exile lasts. And we see that God uses unlikely secular leaders like Cyrus, also Darius, Artaxerxes. Um, some are more amenable to God's promptings than others, but God can work through anybody, believer or non-believer. We see the importance of faith and worship. There's a lot of hardship in the people that return. This is not an easy rebuilding process. It, it actually causes them to fall into sort of spiritual apathy because there's just so much difficulty, not only in the physical work, but sort of at every turn there's opposition. It's not a smooth road to rebuild this temple. It's not like the first building where we saw, you know, King Solomon and everyone brought um, things to use in the building and other countries sent materials. This is a little more difficult. Uh, so Ezra is concerned about spiritual revival. He wants the people to worship in the manner that God desires. He wants the people to fast and petition. There's a lot about fasting in these books post-exile. In Ezra, Nehemiah, and in the book of Esther, we'll see. Um, seeking God's will, listening, not taking a step without making sure that your will is aligned with God's will. That's going to become really important. And then renewing their covenant. So you can see they're trying to avoid making the mistakes of the past. Learn from the past. Let's move forward in faith. And let's make sure that we don't lose sight of God and God's law like our predecessors did. There's emphasis on community in all of these post-exilic books. To rebuild, to restore, to be reformed, the people need one another. And then there's emphasis on future expectation. So this return is not all that glitters. Uh, it's not the time of Solomon when there was relative peace and prosperity for God's people. This is a difficult time period and it will continue to be difficult. And in fact, it will be even more difficult as the years go by leading up to uh, Jesus Christ coming and they are going to recognize that this isn't all that the prophets have talked about a time when Israel will be the pinnacle of the world once more and everyone will come to worship and rivers of living water will flow from Jerusalem and streets will be paved with gold and so clearly they return and go okay this is not that. Um, that prophecy hasn't been fulfilled yet. So they're looking to the future for the full restoration of Israel at some point. And they're going to start looking to this Messiah figure that has been prophesied about. This Messiah that will come and restore Israel to its former glory. Important to keep in mind as well when we approach the New Testament. Uh, they are looking for a human king, a political ruler, a fierce warrior to bring back what Israel has lost, bring back those golden years. And instead, they're going to be met by a baby in a manger, uh, a humble man, a carpenter living in Galilee, nothing of what they expect, and yet bringing so much more than they could ever hope for. All right, so that brings us to the end of Ezra. Next, we will look at the book of Nehemiah. Let me close us in prayer. Gracious God, thank you so much that even in our most difficult moments, as the Jewish people experience here in this rebuilding process, 
you are with us and you have given us hope for a fully restored future. So God, if we find ourselves in a time of rebuilding, give us strength, give us comfort, give us endurance, Lord, and most of all, give us the peace that comes from knowing that you are at work and that one day all things truly will be restored. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I'll see you for the next lecture on Nehemiah.